There we go. So last week I was talking out of the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking to this large crowd of Jews on a hillside in Galilee. It's one of the longest sermons that are recorded in the New Testament from Jesus. It takes like three whole chapters of Matthew. And like any preacher who's reading through it is like, isn't this like 45 sermons worth of material? But Jesus like gives these little snippets and then he moves on instead of elaborating on things. Gives us a lot of material for preaching today, really, honestly. But after talking about being salt and light in the world and letting the goodness of God shine through our lives, he transitions. And he throws a disclaimer out at the very beginning of his sermon. My wife is really good at that. And Jesus does something like this too, because he recognizes that some people are going to accuse him of trying to overthrow Moses, the law, and the prophets. And that is not at all what he was intending to do. So right after talking about being salt and light, he continues in the Sermon on the Mount speaking, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now this is a good thing to get out up front because it upends any thought that he's trying to do away with the law of Moses. But it also sets up the theme of the next portion of his sermon here on the mount. which is summarized in this one verse here. He says to this crowd of fishermen, carpenters, farmers, villagers, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know any scribes or Pharisees personally. But in those days, those people knew them. So I'll give you a comparison. This last summer, we went down to the Grand Canyon for a family adventure. We don't often call them vacations because it's much more of an adventure than a vacation. And this year's adventure involved me, Ariana, and Micaiah hiking to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and then camping overnight and coming back out the next day. And we thought that this was pretty adventurous because when I went to the website to read about hiking down into the Grand Canyon, the National Park Service says, most people cannot make it to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. If you're not physically fit, you should not try. If you want to attempt it, you should go on this one trail that has water stops along the way, is well-developed and doesn't have terribly steep grades and so forth like that. But most people are not able to do it. So I decided, okay, we need to make sure we're really physically fit before we get to the Grand Canyon. So it was uh, soccer season before we, our trip, and I have this exercise that I call killers, where we run a sprint. First from the end line to the 18-yard line and back, and then from the end line to the half line and back, and a full-out sprint. And then from one end line all the way to the far side of the field, 120 yards down, and back. And then we do that three more times on repeat. And it's like death. And we do this at the end of practice when we're already worn out and tired and exhausted. And I ran these with the kids. And Makai and Ariana were both on the team, and so I was like, this will be good. This will get us ready for the Grand Canyon. Of course, I couldn't use that to incite the rest of the team to you know, encourage them. None of them were going to the Grand Canyon, so I always refer to the tournament at the end of the season. Four games in one day. We've got to survive, all four of them. <laughs> Anyhow, so we finally get revved up, and we get to the trail at the top of the Grand Canyon, and you know, it says, don't go any further than you're physically able to. Every step down is optional. Every step back out is not. <laughs> They don't like bodies left in the canyon. And um, 
You know, the sign's talking about how it's a $3,000 helicopter ride back out of the bottom of the canyon if you get down there and can't get back out. And just everything is like skull and crossbones, beware, danger ahead, don't proceed. And so Ariana and Makai and I get out early in the morning with a little fear and trepidation, we're heading down the trail. And, you know, it's not terribly bad going down. And it was nice in the cool of the day because we started at about 5.30. Yeah, we got about halfway to the bottom and we started coming across these people that were going up. And some of them had, you know, camped overnight the night before. And some of them did not have a single pack on them. They had like a single water bottle. It was like, you didn't camp last night. What's up with you? And they're like, oh yeah, I left at two this morning and got to the bottom by six and now I'm on my way back out. And we're just like, that's so hardcore. <laughs> the Pharisees and the scribes were like these. Me and Ariana Mackay thought we were being really hardcore Grand Canyon adventure explorers because we were going to try and get down to the bottom and back out in two days' time. And there was people that were far more extreme than us, who just with a pack of snacks and a single water bottle, were going to do it in a single morning. And they were running. Like, they're not walking, they're running. It's insane, a rough terrain. And then the second morning, we get up at like five in the morning and we're finally packed up and out of camp and we stop at the water before we leave the river. And this guy comes through and he's like, yeah, I'm going from rim to rim and I'm kind of taking it easy this year because it's really hot out because it was crazy hot. And like last year I did from the south rim to the north rim, which is 13 miles, and then back in a single day. And we just kind of looked at each other and we're like, this sounds like death. <laughs> but once again, yeah, he's got his water bottle and he's got a pack of snacks and he's running the trail. We're like, this guy's insane. The Pharisees and the scribes were like these maniac <coughs> Grand Canyon adventurers who do a rim to a rim in a single day or a rim to a rim and then back to the first rim in a single day. You know, going rim to rim and then back again is a marathon's distance with a vertical elevation change of like 4,800 feet each direction. You try to do that in 12 or 13 hours. It makes an Ironman competition seem easy. It's just insane. And so I imagine that the crowd listening to Jesus say that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That was an intimidating statement. That's the equivalent of you have to run from the rim of the Grand Canyon to the far rim of the Grand Canyon and back or you're not in. Who could do that? That seems really, really intense. And then Jesus labors this point and gives lots of good illustrations. He says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Most days that seems reasonably easy. I can get to sundown without a body to hide. <laughs> Most days. Other days are more challenging. Okay, that almost seems doable. And Jesus is reviewing some of the common teachings of the day. And every fisherman and every carpenter is like there. Yeah, there was that one day I almost had a body I had to throw in the Sea of Galilee. But I got through that day. I didn't murder anybody. It was a successful day. And then Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Now that ups the ante a little bit. You know, Peter and Andrew were brothers, and they were fishermen, and they had some issues with each other. <laughs> I think they're probably looking at each other like, let's not talk about last year. No, that time out in the boat, 
We threw the net and dropped it, and we lost it on the bottom of the lake, and I had to dive in after it, and we're not talking about that. There was words said, we're not bringing that up again. What happened in the boat stays in the boat. We both survived, but here Jesus says, if you're angry, has anybody ever been angry with your brother or your sister? Yes? Liable to judgment. And he continues on. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. As if it wasn't clear, Jesus is pointing out that it is not just your actions, it is also your thoughts and motivations in your heart. It's not that you just have to refrain from killing your brother like Cain did. You can't hate him, you can't be angry with him. It's not just that you have to refrain from being with other women, you can't think the way you think about them. And he continues... He's not done. He says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is above and beyond. This is far more than what even Moses required. And this makes the law of Moses look like it's just the threshold for getting by. Ever get a D minus in school? There were some times as a professor at NDSU where there were some students I was like, I can't handle the thought of you being in my class again next year. Somehow we've got to get you to 59.5% so that I can justify rounding up so you have D minus. And there's no way that I can say you're competent or qualified, but technically you passed. <laughs> Jesus makes the law of Moses with divorce seem like that D minus threshold. Just barely getting by. It may be lawful to divorce your wife, but this is what you're really doing. You're really not getting through this at all. And it just keeps coming. He develops this theme about the righteousness needing to exceed that of the Pharisees through and through. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. One of the implications of this exhortation is that People did not uphold their word particularly regularly. See, so why do you have to swear by heaven that you're going to do something? It's because the person listening to you doesn't trust that you're actually going to do it if you just say, oh, I'll go do that tomorrow. And be like, the heck you will. I remember what you told me you were going to do last week. You left me high and dry. Uh-uh. So then to add a little impetus, I swear by heaven that I shall do this for you tomorrow. So maybe they will believe him. And Jesus says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. That means if you ever say you're going to do something, you have to do it. You're supposed to do it and fulfill what you say to do. Then Jesus puts them over the top, I think, here. It says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. See, this passage in Moses, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
was originally intended for judges to use in meeting out punishment for offenders of violent assaults. If you hit somebody and you break their arm, we're not going to execute you. That would be above and beyond. But you'll suffer a broken arm. See, we keep our punishment in line with the offense. But I suspect in Jesus' day, this was used for, you hit me, so I'm going to hit you back. Not so much in the court of law, but in the court of our own heart. You hit me, I'm going to hit you right back. If you do something to me, I will retaliate and get my vengeance right now. Ever notice how human anger doesn't produce the justice or righteousness of God? <laughs> Because then the argument is, well, you just hit me back harder, so I'm going to hit you back harder. <laughs> Pretty soon it's a brawl. It's an open fight. Jesus says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's counterintuitive. That's hard. To endure pain and expect more. It's very unnatural. This was a new word. And he continues. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that's not in the law of Moses. Not at all. This is just more of a common teaching of the day. Love your neighbor, because that's said in the law of Moses, but will allow you to hate your enemy because they're not your neighbor. That was the question of Jesus' day. Since the law of Moses says, love thy neighbor, who is my neighbor? If I think you're my enemy, then I don't think you qualify as my neighbor, so I can hate you, which might translate into hitting you. But Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is also counterintuitive. This is not just bare minimum, refrain from murdering those who hurt you. You want us to pray for them and love them? How are we supposed to do that? But Jesus gives a justification as to why. He says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. See, in our human sense of justice, we would like lightning bolts to come down on those who are wicked on a regular basis. That would satisfy our sense of human justice. They're mean. We need a thunderbolt about them now. And that's what most people thought God was like. And Jesus is illustrating here, actually he's not. And every one of us in this room can attest that lightning bolts do not come down from heaven nearly as often as we would like. You know, John and James actually were talking to Jesus about that. Shall we call down fire from heaven, even like Elijah used to do? A euphemism for lightning bolts from the sky. People who are unjust get rain when they need it and sunshine when they need it. God is kind and provides for those who do not serve him, do not worship him, do not call on his name, to the point where we would almost perhaps in America say, God is an enabler of the wicked. He allows and enables them to live quite well on earth through their entire life. Because he's patient waiting for them to turn to repentance. And he will send rain and sunshine through an entire lifetime 
They must starve to death before they choose to repent, if they so choose. And Jesus exhorts the crowd there that day to be like our Heavenly Father in the way we treat the unjust and the wicked. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Remember, the Jews were supposed to be a priestly people, a people set apart for God, a people that lived more righteously than everyone else because they had the law of Moses. And Jesus is pointing out, really, the way you have enacted this, you're not really any different than all the Gentile nations who have the same sense of human justice. And then just put an exclamation point on his point here. He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that's a righteousness exceeding the Pharisees. Now at this point, if I were in the crowd, a sense of hopelessness might set in, because who can attain to that? You see, they were familiar with Pharisees and scribes, who they seemed to be like the crazy, awesome, righteous, hardcore people of their time. And so it looked like to them, at least somebody can attain to the law of Moses, and some people will be able to stand before God someday. I may not be one of them, but somebody can do it. Just like that morning when Ariana and Micaiah and I went to the water spigot at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, we saw somebody who had left at two in the morning with a headlight, ran down into the bottom of the Grand Canyon to make it to the bottom by six. We could see it is possible someone can do it. We have living proof right in front of us. But the standard that Jesus just laid before them that morning, in that sermon, is all above and beyond rim to rim. Imagine a human starting down in Tierra del Fuego, South America, the far southern tip, and they set out on a run, and they make it to Nome, Alaska. That's a little challenging. There's an unpaved section about 60 miles long between Colombia and Panama, so they'd be bushwhacking through a swamp to get through that 60-mile section. The rest of it, it might be paved, though. You get to Nome, Alaska, and that the Bering Sea's frozen over, then you run across the Bering Sea, 60 miles across there to Siberia. Now, there's no roads in that section of Siberia, so you have to run to the nearest road, which is Magadan, about 1,200 miles away. There you get a gravel road, run across the continent of Asia to the Sinai Peninsula, cross the Suez Canal, and then head south across the Sahara Desert, and then make it to the tip of South Africa. That's what Jesus laid before them that day. You see, we know it's humanly possible for someone to go rim to rim of the Grand Canyon, but it is not humanly possible to run from the tip of South America to the tip of South Africa via the Bering Strait. And that's what Jesus laid out. Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. theoretically possible. No one has ever done it. And the irony is that at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus just lets them hang on this point. How can our righteousness exceed the Pharisees and the scribes and actually attain to God's level of righteousness? See, we're corrupt humans. It's not actually possible. And if they reflected on the Old Testament, they remember the words of Isaiah. We have all become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, our sin, 
like the wind, take us away. So even the prophet Isaiah recognized and wrote into this poetry here that our righteousness is so lacking compared to the righteousness of God, it's like taking a filthy rag and trying to compare it to a wedding dress. Queen Victoria's wedding dress. It was white, set the standard for all wedding dresses thereafter. No bride wears a filthy rag on her wedding day. And no filthy rag ever has the hope or potential of being a wedding dress. In the same way that we, in our own righteousness, just can never ever hope to attain to the righteousness of God. Because we're corrupted. And you know, Jesus never even gave them the next step. This was one of the themes of his ministry on earth. You can't live a perfect life. And then he let his disciples fill in after he was gone. Because he was the Lamb of God come to save the world from their sins. Paul writes in Romans, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. You know, Jesus set the stage in the Sermon on the Mount for everyone to realize, I can't do that. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they thought they could. They ironed out this standard from the Law of Moses. This is the standard of righteousness, and we are going to attain to it. Paul was one of them. He said he did. He was flawless, according to the Pharisees. And yet his flawlessness was you know, better than a filthy rag compared to God. See, we needed the righteousness of God because we were never going to attain to it from ourselves, by ourselves. Paul continues, There is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. 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 All Amen. sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We aren't making it from Tierra del Fuego to Cape Town, South Africa. Not doing it. We're all justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Propitiation, that's a big old word. I once heard of a parent describing it to one of their younger children. I asked them at bedtime, what does the word propitiation mean? So that's when you're about to get a spanking and Jesus moves in the way and takes the spanking for you. <laughs> that makes sense. Wow, okay. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And forbearance is a banking term where they don't require you to repay a loan that you normally would need to repay. And oftentimes banks don't enter forbearance for very long. They'll maybe let you go a month or two and then they start sending letters, we'd like our money. You know, the Heavenly Father told Adam, you may eat from any tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And it wasn't long when both he and his wife ate from that tree and attained the knowledge of good and evil, disobeying the command of God. And you know, God's forbearance started that day and lasted until the crucifixion of Jesus, who ultimately died to pay that debt. And his forbearance continues for us today in the sense that we have our entire lifetime to decide, are we going to embrace Jesus' death, or are we going to try and do it ourselves? Are we going to accept the free gift of Jesus' righteousness, or are we going to 
try to measure up ourselves. Anybody ever notice how it's hard to measure up? Hard to get through a day measuring up? If you have people that live with you in your house, it might be hard to get through an hour measuring up. Later, Paul writes, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Anybody out there perfect, unlike myself? Anybody imperfect like me? Yes. Anybody like that free gift of righteousness? Oh, Each and every one of us needs that free gift of righteousness. In the last month, you may have received a lot of gifts. Do you know how you receive a gift? You accept it. You open your hands. You're like, thank you. I'll take that. I'll receive that. You're God's free gift of righteousness that comes through Jesus, his righteousness given to us, is something that we just need to accept. But to humble ourselves and recognize, I can't attain to God's standard of righteousness in my life and accept his righteousness on our behalf Amen. his sacrifice he died for our sins so we don't have to die for our sins yep. and we have to trust and believe that his death is enough for our salvation and that nothing we can do can earn it It's a long trek from Tierra del Fuego to Cape Town, South Africa, especially if you go via Siberia. <laughs> it sounds like an amazing adventure, but it's not one I'm going to ever do in my life on foot. The righteousness of God is not attainable through our own efforts, but it is a gift that we can accept, if we believe. Anybody out there like, yes, please. Come in line, I'll take that. Thank you. More over here, thank you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that free gift of righteousness from your son, Jesus. Lord, he made it so abundantly clear in the Sermon on the Mount, that our righteousness can't attain to your standard of perfection, and that we need your righteousness given to us because our own righteousness falls so short. And Lord, we humble ourselves this morning and recognize that our efforts are insufficient, that we can never earn your favor, we can never earn your righteousness, that we need to just receive it freely from you in the depths of our need. And we pray, Lord, you'd help us to receive this gift by grace. You give us the faith that we can believe and trust the sacrifice of your Son was sufficient. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that by your Spirit, you'd be transforming us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Holy Spirit impart into you a stronger sense of your need for the righteousness of God that we cannot earn or attain to ourselves. Amen. Amen. Amen.